Once upon a time, there was a land of neon rainbows called King's Cross. Abe Saffron would have to be Tilly Devine the most John and Kate Lee. vile, amoral, and absolutely corrupt criminal. Trying to make a living, working hard to get to heaven. Hello and welcome along to the community notice board. Hello. Welcome to another episode of Community Notice Board, a podcast about suburbs we grew up in, hometown heroes, local landmarks, and coming of age tales. We're back, baby. Just the three of us. We're riding solo again. And we're doing a second part to King's Cross because there was so much we didn't talk about. And this time, we're going for it. We're going all in on the crime. Yeah. it is a filthy cesspool it, of an absolutely. area. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I had all this research about this guy. And then uh, I probably... It was like I was doing a year three project again. I had a PowerPoint slide. <laughs> yeah. I had headings. I was about ready to cut it out and yeah. stick it on a... Big fl- cardboard. Big cardboard thing with glitter and glue. <laughs> yeah. like and made then, a diorama. Yeah, yeah. And have then, you ever uh, put like uh, a bunch of time into anything at school and just have it be completely wrong? <laughs> uh, no, I... I haven't done that. I remember once in like year two, we did a project and I, it was like, yeah, doing an Australian animal. And I did it on bats and I did, and I was put so much effort in and I got um, a plus plus and I was like, man, I rule. And I realized that was the teacher was like a complete spaz. And she, that was the second lowest mark she gave out. She gave out <laughs> a plus 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 and, uh, and, uh, and a plus plus. A plus was the lowest mark, and I Jeez. got A plus plus. A plus plus must do better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was just like what? It's a real uh, like participation, participation trophy. Yeah. Oh yeah, but it was like, it was like participation trophy, but it was just a trophy that didn't say participation until you realize everyone else has said first yeah. place. You know, well, that's you like you like winning like winning the coaches award, and then you find out everyone won the coaches award. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So that that's I I remember thinking like I'd nailed it, and then like oh man, I fucking stink. Remember once when <laughs> I was in year four, like I had one of those uh, kind of matildary inspiring teachers who's like, "There's more to learning than just books. Like you can have fun with it." And and she was great most of the time. And she like told us like when we did like assignments about English or maths and stuff, like you know, don't just write it down like all boring. You can like have fun with it. Like put illustrations on there and stuff. And then showed us like this example of like a short story in English where it pointed out like the grammatical stuff with like little cartoon characters like jumping on like uh, like where dashes were or like a little man pointing at like a full stop being like a full stop is the end of a sentence and stuff and so she like gave us this uh assignment on apostrophe use and i wrote this like i spent ages like writing this two page thing with all these illustrations of like guys parachuting in where the apostrophe was supposed to go but i got the apostrophe wrong by one letter on every single one (laughs) so i spent like two hours doing all these drawings being like learning's fun and then she's like but they're all incorrect (laughs) no every every single one i got a zero uh probably like seven maybe Oh, a zero. That's brutal. Wow. I actually reminded me, I did a whole speech and it was a correct speech. I was supposed to do on the Anzacs, but I, the whole speech, I said Aztecs, the entire <laughs> speech. That's a so real kab- kabucha kumbacha yeah, situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just, and everyone's laughing. And um, <laughs> you I remember you're I, had, I had some gags in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like bombing without knowing it. It was oh, unbelievable. No. Yeah. I had a thing in, um, in kindy where I loved drawing Um, I'd get a piece of paper and do a line basically in the center and then have like the above world and the below world. And I think I had like books of like medieval castles where they'd show you what people are doing inside and stuff. And so I'd kind of recreate that. And so I'd have little tunnels and like diggers and then I'd have like a castle up top and like I'd just draw everything that was going on above and below. And this fucking kid saw me drawing one one day and then he started drawing one and just did this like half ass shitty version but because he got it to the teacher first she was like look at this amazing creativity from justin and i was like i'm gonna fucking choke this kid out and die his body i hate this kid <laughs> draw him below the ground underground yeah, yeah. that's where you're going justin i got uh, punked real bad in year 12 once 
uh, maybe no, it was year eleven. I was doing three unit English, and uh, you know how when you start doing like English later in school, there's all like ways you can read texts. So you can't just read for enjoyment anymore. Like you've got to interpret it in some way most yeah. of the time. Yeah. So like, there's a Freudian way to read things, and that's always like you want to fuck your mom or you want to fuck everything or everything's a dick or something. So like they assigned us to do this like Freudian reading on Disney's the little mermaid. And so me and my friend Marty, we just like, and my friend Mike, we literally spent a whole lesson just making fun of the concept by being like the, the secret Freudian reading of little mermaid is that it is in fact a penis. And then just like wrote penis in as many things as we could possible like we were we were killing ourselves at how clever we were we said at one point that someone performed an erotic monocle dance and we were just going <laughs> ham on it and at the end of the lesson we gave it in thinking like this will be a bit of fun and uh she did not think it was a bit of fun our teacher <laughs> she like found us the next day and was like i this is the most disgusting thing I've ever read. This is disgusting. <laughs> you guys, there's something seriously wrong with you. How dare you hand this in to me, a teacher? I am going to call your parents and get them to look at this. And all three of us instantly caved and were like, oh, no, 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 don't, don't do that. We'll write it again. We'll write it again. She was like, okay, well, better be on my desk by nine o'clock. So we, I think she told us at like 10 to eight. So then we just spent like all before school instead of just hanging out like rewriting this essay so that we could get it done and give it to her and like years later we realized that the, it was just a con she was never going to call our parents about this penis paper like <laughs> she just used the thread of it to get us to bitch out and write a new paper which we did when we could have just been like get mm. fucked like real, it's a, real it's rebel a, without a cause there yeah yeah, 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 I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it starts so cool um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean we did all the work she, but then we figured out later she was a dumb bitch and, uh, <laughs> she wasn't even going to she didn't even yeah. have we, balls we, to we, sure, we sure showed her. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. All right. Ugh. Speaking of showing people up, we got some fucking crime lords. So so yeah, we we, we dug back into uh, King's, King's Cross, Cross and we've got some sort of errors of crime because I think it's just it's just like so we much do, happens. Uh, you could do an entire podcast season. You know, you could do like twenty four episodes on King's Cross. People yeah. probably have. Yeah. They've yeah. probably done better once. No one's ever talked about it before. It's <laughs> no the first ever, time. No one's ever talked about two, true crime on a podcast. No, I know. We're the first ones. <laughs> it's so you've got someone joining this way. Yeah, uh, I think we're going to start chronologically. So I'm yeah. starting in the uh, roaring 20s for my person. Um, and I'm talking about Tilly Devine, who was one of uh, the prominent ra- like leaders of one of the prominent Razor gangs. In, and is, is that um, a real name? Because that is like a straight up. Porn it's, name, strip well, yeah. name. Razor gangs aren't what they call themselves. So it wasn't like us going around being like, hey, three beers for the Comnot boys, as we often do when we go to pubs. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Is that her name? Not the Tilly, Razor Tilly gang Tilly name. Divine. Was her name Tilly Divine? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that what that oh, oh, you mean you think that's like her street name? Like yeah. A, like well, a it's, cool... such, it's such a cool, like... Strippery name that it's like that. How yeah, is that I fucking... think it's short for something. Let me double check. Matilda that Divine. Yeah, I think it is. Right. Matilda. Which is still cool. It's still cool. Yeah, I mean, like, there's <laughs> all any Divine. No, you can be Alan Divine. It's still yeah. pretty cool. You know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Matilda. Right. Matilda Mary <laughs> Divine. Oh, well, she was born Mary Matilda Twist, which I guess twist, <laughs> twist, <laughs> no T. All oh. oh, right. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, so she did get which the I old guess stage is lame. Time. Yeah, still. but uh, yeah, she's got the stage name. Um, yeah, so she was part of. She was a leader of a Razor Gang, and uh, so that, which, that, what, so they what are they? So Razor Gangs basically they don't call themselves the Razor Gang. The Razor Gang was because um, in 1927 the Pistol Licensing Act was introduced in New South Wales, which meant that like uh, if you were caught carrying an unlicensed gun, you could be put automatically in prison. Mm-hmm. So basically, a bunch of underworld people who had guns were like, oh, well, we're fucked now because all our weapons are unlicensed. So they junked them and they traded them for a straight razor because they do a bunch of damage and they can also be bought like from a barber's shop for a few pence and it's completely illegal. And this is also like before facial reconstruction surgery. So you're fucking cutting someone's ass up like they're disfigured for life. Like there's there's no go back from that. I love how they were like, you know... It's illegal to have a gun, and like, oh no, now we can't murder people uh, yeah. <laughs> without 
There's like, wasn't that, what, what were they going to use the gun for legally anyway? Like, surely they couldn't give a shit about a fucking silly rule like that. I mean, gu- holding an unlicensed gun carting around now is illegal, but people still have guns. It must have just Yeah, been that's a really good point, actually. I didn't really, yeah, I just realized that if I was walking around with a gun in my pants, someone would probably be like, hey, that's n- not on. No, yeah, it's like, it would probably be like, should have bought my straight be, razor. Yeah. It'd be one of those things where the cops could use it like use something small as a pretense to search you and then give you like ultra harsh pen- yeah. penalties you know it just wouldn't be worth it yeah right. there's a there's there's a lot of this in this time from tilly divine where like gangsters are just like straight up getting away with stuff so cops are like what if we introduce a law where we think someone's bad we can arrest them and their entire oh, family yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah. totally I mean, so yeah. and the, imagine how many people walk around looking like the joker back then with these fucking razor gangs yeah give them the glasgow smile baby fuck um but yeah you could just slash someone's ass up and like you, you know if you carry a razor blade around you're just like yeah i've got bloody stubble mate <laughs> Come on. Come on, that's good enough, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you fall one for this? Just winking at the cop. Yeah, um, right. So basically, uh, Tilly Devine was an English prostitute. And um, she followed her husband, who was an Australian soldier, and she followed him back. And I uh, wonder how they met. Blind day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sitting at the dock of the bay. <laughs> And but well, this guy did the old uh, goes to another school trick of like bragging to her about all the stuff he had back in Australia. Just oh, been like, no. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm rich back in Australia. Everyone loves me. I'm well respected. <laughs> and he told her that like he had a, like a whole farm, a kangaroo farm, being like, hey, if you ever come to Australia. You know, like if you ever come to Australia, you can come stay with me on my kangaroo farm. And oh, Tilly's man. like, okay, and he's like, fuck shit. He's sweating <laughs> bullets on that that three yeah. months back. He's yeah, like oh, firing off some letters to man. friends. Oh, it is hope crazy the, how hope they haven't much. sold the farm out from under me. I don't know. Uh. The, 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 and the fascination with kangaroos doesn't go away. When I moved here at thirteen, everyone was like, "Is there going to be a kangaroo in your backyard?" And I was just like, "Hell yeah, there is." Yeah, people generally, like, I... We used to get kangas at, on my house in, like, just a suburban street. that shit on the front fucking mat. I had a friend who was, um... I don't know how I knew him, but they were like... They they were like, can you see kangaroos in the street? Like, like as in Sydney, the street. Like, not... Because yeah. I think that people i have hit a kangaroo driving. It's like, yeah, but not going down Macquarie Street, you know? Like, yeah. that, <laughs> that, that, there is this idea that... I haven't and seen I one thinking, of Charlie Chan's after work. And, and I think, uh... Yeah, yeah, because the um, people think they're like foxes and stuff, and which I obviously I, it still is not like down the main street, but I think they're way more in the cities in the UK than kangaroos. Like you wouldn't, like you used to get them at your place, Drew. Yeah, like we, all, like every afternoon, I lived across from a footy oval, and there was like further down towards the end of the street, there was like a nature reserve, so it made sense. But literally every afternoon you'd walk to the footy oval and there'd be just shit ton of kangaroos. And I used to work a lot, I'd, like a lot of jobs where I'd finish really late. And if I dro- when I was driving home, there'd just be big fucking kangas sitting like, on my front yard where I parked my car, oh. just in the street all the time. Yeah, damn it. Yeah, no, I didn't think that. Fucking, I mean, yeah. That, where was that in Queenbo? Queenbo, yeah. Shit. Yeah, so this guy is like, hell yeah, kangaroos, baby. And uh, she says, yeah. And he's like, fuck, all right. God damn it. What am I going to do? Gets married to her. She kind of, she shows up and realizes not only does her husband not have a kangaroo farm, but he's also completely <laughs> broke. Yeah. He uh, just, like, also, just <laughs> takes it to the middle of Sydney and he's like, they developed my farm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they put up all these terraces on my yeah. farm. And he's just kind of like an abusive piece of shit as well once they get there. But she, um, so they basically get to Australia and he's like, no kangaroos, <laughs> uh, damn you, city of Sydney. Mm. And he's like, well, we're going to have to do the next best thing. You're going to have to start hooking. And oh, she no. becomes a prostitute in Sydney because she was already a prostitute in um, England. And okay. then she becomes... Uh, as less ad- horrible, slightly, somehow. Yes. <laughs> like, so she, he didn't force her into a life prostitution. No, 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 so no, you no, got to. No. He, I mean, he to your sucks, fault. but oh, like, absolutely, yes, sure, I know. Yeah, not but he's defending away him. With this I just one. clarify. Yeah, <laughs> but yes. um, she later becomes a madam of a brothel because the New South Wales Vagrancy Act 
stopped men from running brothels, but it didn't mean, but that meant that women could run it. And so I think this is like the second time in four weeks on this podcast where there has been a legal loophole to allow brothels to thrive, which just means like Australian lawmakers must be like, we need to nail down these brothels and people are like, hey, make the language pretty broad, all right? Like- <laughs> the world finds a way, man. Like, you yeah. know, you can't stop it. I, that's that's what I've taken away. What, what like, I get, was the men stopping thing to try to stop brothels or is it because that was like to try to stop I, uh, sort of forced I sex assume what the idea was situation. was like to stop uh, forcing women into sex work that they did not want to be a part of, stopping abuse, but also like the complete internalized misogyny of, but a woman could never run a business, so we're completely safe on this side. Oh my God. And Tilly Devine's like, get fucked, I'll do it. Mm. And so she like becomes pretty rich from running brothels. And uh, then she diversified her operations. And then I've got a thing from a historian called Larry Reiter, which is a great name for a historian. Uh, (laughs) That's his stage name. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, So basically, she had like tears in her broth. So there were elite call girls, which were for politicians, businessmen, and like uh, overseas dignitaries and stuff. And then there were tenement girls who um, were the young working class women who resorted to the casual prostitution. And then there was something called boat girls. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, who are older female prostitute, and they basically cater to the working class man or itinerant sailors. Okay. And just when you're thinking that Tilly Devine made your girl boss vibes, she also did, hated gay people. And so she oh didn't let God. like this go in her brothel. But um, she becomes really... She didn't let gay yeah, men she didn't, become... She didn't, like gay men being no, involved no with rent brothel. boys. No, I was gonna say she said it wasn't right. It's pretty. It's probably, you know, no gay man can have sex with my women. Truly, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't, I don't really know what much of a stand you're making there, but uh, <laughs> so, so Tilly, uh, she's a bit of a character. She <laughs> fucking. This, I'll say. Well, this is the point. <laughs> this is the point in history where bars are gender segregated as well. And Tilly's solution to this is to just like double bird and be like, "Fuck that!" And she just like walks into them and just like hangs out in the male areas. And if people have a problem, she hits them. Um, <laughs> Another sick. loophole to the. Yeah, 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 to yeah, the yeah. <laughs> She was known for fucking slashing dudes in the face when they if they tried to skip out on paying for their sex workers. So if a guy was like, "Hey, I'm broke," she'd be like, "I'm gonna fucking gonna cut you up." Damn. And apparently, this is cool as well. There were some like crookedish cops or cops that like didn't uh, agree with what she was doing. So she would just soak them in petrol and set them on fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as a mess. Damn. Oh, that's, uh, yeah. That's so she rocks. Hashtag A cab. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah. do I? She's uh, done this stuff. All cops are burning. <laughs> all cops are burning. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh. at this time, she's uh, she's also at war. Oddly enough, with like another female kingpin. Uh, this woman is called Queenpin. Kate. Yes. Sorry, there girl boss. And she's uh. <laughs> She's a, she. Her name is Kate Lee. She's called the Queen of Surrey Hills. So Kate, um, she makes a name for herself uh, dealing in sly grog, which are like establishments that illegally serve booze, like whether they be like bootleg bars or bottle shops. Um, and these two ladies, they fucking hate each other. No yeah, one's quite right. sure how it like kicked off. Like there are multiple theories and multiple stories. I believe Razor, the underbelly show. Uh, pinpoints the feud is starting because like one stole the other one's pomeranian dog and <laughs> she was just like i'm when did this happen this. this is 2020 in the or 1920 <laughs> yeah this is not 2020 the queen of surrey hills is mad at this girl. i was like come on this <laughs> yeah, is like pomeranian. not a fucking this happens once but a year. Th- this is a good early story about uh kate lee and tilly divine so apparently there's a policewoman doing a patrol around Tilly's neighborhood and Tilly gets upset at this. She doesn't like cops, obviously, from the burning thing. So she goes up to this policewoman, starts like shaking her and bothering her and being like, what the fuck are you doing patrolling my streets? 
Mm. At this moment, right, a passing, like, tram car comes by and flying off it comes Kate Lee, who sucker punches Tilly. So oh, she God, jumps oh off God. a moving tram to smash Tilly Devine in the head. It's like a WWE fucking yeah, finishing move. Yeah, and so then, like, uh, this Kate person who flew off the tram, she pins Tilly and tells the cop, like, be on your way, love, and if she ever bothers you again, I'll fucking crack her again. Oh, and so oh, the two that basically... tapped off. Yeah, oh, the two yeah. basically go to war. So they start, like, uh, destroying each other's businesses, like, trashing the shop fronts or, you know, brothels that they run. They're slashing each other's employees up, so, uh, like, the, the prostitutes and the dealers that they have... Um, they both do jail time because um, the cops who had basically lost all control of King's Cross introduced this law that lets them arrest anyone that has bad character. <laughs> and so, like, the bad character system means that anyone who has, like, a bad image <laughs> the, publicly... The bad vibe law. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't like the vibe of this guy. Yeah, so, like, you're sitting and someone's like, can I have a cigarette? And they're like, nah, get fucked. You're like, I don't like this guy. And minutes later, he's arrested. He's a gitmo. <laughs> Um, you could just clean up all of King's Cross with that law, you know. Just walk around and like this guy. Yeah, yeah. well, that's kind of what his hat happened. They on, made yeah. like a lot of sweeping arrests, just being because. So basically, people who um, had a bad public image got hit by this a lot. So if you're in the so the press was kind of became a weapon here so if the press was like this person's a shitty bloke the cops would be like all right well the, there's a public consensus that this person's a shitty bloke i'm gonna get them so it's cancelled yeah That's what it is. It's, it's cancel culture <laughs> gone too far and every, everything is cyclical oh my lord and um damn yeah, That's crazy. so they all moved to Austin and started a podcast studio. <laughs> Rebelled against <them. laughs> Yeah, where yeah. there's uh, tax breaks and Spotify can give them millions. <laughs> um, so basically, Tilly and Kate, kind of, they're not stupid, and they know that this system is bad for them, but they also know that public opinion can be swayed easily through the media. So they start using the press to rat each other out, like being like this, this person did something shitty. This is Facebook posting, you know, yeah, like yeah, they yeah. posting about someone. <laughs> yeah, well, it is because while they're ratting people out, they're also pumping their own tires. You know, like they start publicly donating to charity, and Kate Lee is real good at it. She like picks like the mainstream charities, and is like seen out a lot, and she's jovial and good with a quote. Tilly picks like really niche charities and is violent and kind of like piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's like she's, the charities, like you know, defund the uh, yeah the, the gay rights establishment. Yeah, yeah. Reduce <laughs> the petrol excise so I can uh, set more people on fire. <laughs> yeah. You know, that'd be great. Yeah, oh, exactly. She, yeah. So she just so they're just posting you know stories of a screenshot of the notes app, basically just back and forth. Just like uh, if anyone talks to Tilly, she can you know <laughs> yeah, don't listen to yeah. what she's saying about me because uh, she's a dumb bitch and she set people on fire and I punched her out of a tram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what happened. Sick. So um, basically, th th they do that. They both go to jail. I think Kate Lee goes to jail for quite a bit longer. Eventually, later in life, they both they squash the beef. Mm -hmm. And they they kind of become friends, and they both uh, they both lose most of their wealth because they earn like a shit ton of money. But like the great Al Capone, they the, they got done by the tax man, mm. and they also eventually got done by paying off coppers who they bribed pretty heavily. So I think uh, Kate Lee died first, and Divine lasted quite a bit longer. She she was convicted on 204 occasions in her criminal career. Oh, Pretty cool. Uh, and yeah, basically she died kind of like without much of her wealth, but there's also like a, a little postscript to this story. The great granddaughter of Tilly Devine is a cop in Nowra. Oh, so shit. Failed to stop the fringe bashing that Sam Taunton told us about, obviously. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, um, so there's this article on the Daily Telegraph that says, like, the great-granddaughter of notorious Sydney Madam Tilly Devine is a softly-spoken policewoman from Nowa who 
who reckons Tilly would be turning in her grave with her <laughs> line of work. I was going to say, she'd be yeah. fucking furious. But Tilly wouldn't be turning in her grave. She'd be fucking getting out of it, lighting her on fire. Yeah. Like, yeah. Fuck, she'd be a... turning so fast, she'd be trying to get a spark going, just like smoking <laughs> yeah. the grave out. It's an awkward it's a... fucking family Christmas lunch, you know? It's just <laughs> yeah. like, uh, start wearing the propane over there, Tilly, okay? Your great-granddaughter's here. It'd um, be an awkward lunch if you invited a corpse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So this uh, cop uh, was six years old when Tilly Devine died, but she has plenty of stories from. So she would have uh, met her. Wow. Yeah, like she like, would have met her, but has like no memories memory, of her. Yeah. But she said like her dad has memories because her dad was like, "Yeah, my grandma is obviously a bad person, but she rules." But then she says the most memorable story Dad told me is when he was a young boy. He was in bed one night when he was staying in Tilly's house. He felt a lump under his pillow, reached under and pulled out a revolver. Ooh. And like, that's a fine story. But like when we've led up top with flying train uppercuts and lighting cobs on fire, like reaching under a pillow and finding something's kind of boring. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. especially for a cop who probably has like access to all her release records and stuff unless that was like her giving him a, like the tooth fairy present you know like he'd lost the tooth and she's like oh, this is what you need it's a fucking gun i can't use them anymore the cops will be after me i need a razor you know yeah so the, that was a um and then so like the grandfather said it it said dad always used to refer to tilly as a r- piece of rough nasty cockney english work and then she says, I know she, she did some terrible things. She did run on sentence. I really yeah, thought I was yeah, going to yeah. turn sweet at the end. Uh, <laughs> uh, an old cockney, old battling, you know, a bit of soul of the earth, honest yeah. to God. The classic you know, uh, it's sitcom thing. Worse. It's worse. <laughs> where it's like, Mr. Bensley, this is the most insane, audacious, <laughs> and genius yeah, plan yeah. I've ever <laughs> seen. <laughs> Come here, you. <laughs> But, yeah, um, my yeah. great grandma was the old fashioned, stupid old <laughs> bitch, and I hated her. <laughs> and she can rot. Like, Pretty cool, man. though. I mean, yeah, that's Tilly yeah. Divine, basically. Yeah. Fuck, man. That's crazy. And, like, uh, yeah, I mean, they would, they just, like, I don't know how old she lived or whatever, and I, but, like, you'd treat, like, in the 20s, you would have that life a hundred times over the average life. Like, you know, even if you burnt the flame. Candle at both yeah. ends and you burn out by 35. That sounds like a fucking ball of a time, you know? What yeah, I mean? yeah. That's what you... But, and the, a lot of the stuff with the 20s and that is like... Everyone always assumes that life was more conservative as you go back and that's just indefinite forever. But like the 50s and 60s in Australia was so much more conservative than the whole roaring 20s. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a fucking yeah. party back then. There was, was no rules. Pro- nah. yeah. Also, like, I mean, she was a kingpin. Like, that's rocks. Like, yeah. <laughs> no matter what way you look at it, even though she slashed people with a razor. Yeah, who hasn't? Uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> who hasn't wanted to at the very yeah. least? Justin, uh, that little prick in my kindergarten class, I'd have slashed <laughs> him up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, exactly. And, and all her, like, she just, anything she did against the law, you'd just be like, oh, fuck, she's backed into a fucking corner. Dragged to yeah. the other side of the world under false pretenses, made yeah, to yeah. become a prostitute again, made it, worked her way to the top. Then the cops started harassing her and she just started cutting people. It's like, good, go for it, girl. You know, like, you <laughs> yeah, know, absolutely. I don't, I, there Get wasn't it. even any misjudgments there. I was like, I agree <laughs> with everything, you know, go for it. <laughs> oh, fuck. But uh, yeah, I, so fuck, that was the 20s. And I think like there's sort of, like Drew was saying, I think in the, sort of 50s and 60s well the at least sort of post world war Two, i think you know king's cross maybe wasn't as as violent as that i think it cleaned up but there was a certain gentleman who sort of emerged out of that mm. um that i'd heard his name a bunch but never really knew anything about him but he just kept coming up and he's this guy abe saffron and he's so when i was looking at him some of the quotes about him so first of all he's he he's been the subject himself of three separate royal commissions like one wow, guy just one dude one dude um <laughs> and in all of them in all of the royal commissions like like that were sparked by him and he was named the number one organized criminal in australia and and this is someone that like i don't think you'd even recognize his face you know so they, someone said they called him australia's most vile this is his not his grand 
grandson, but this is like this, uh, Australia's most vile, amoral, and absolutely corrupt criminal. Um, and this was like retrospect, not just at the time. This is someone who called him that through his whole career. And someone also qu- a quote from about Abe: um, "If rooting was an Olympic sport, he'd be a gold medalist." So, oh fuck yeah, <laughs> yeah. Abe, is that quote attributed to him? No, but uh, I think <laughs> he so that was at his best man speech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he was he so he has two biological kids, a son and a daughter, and uh, they both have this weird like uh, relationship with him now, where they're like he was a good father, but I like can see all his flaws. Like he wasn't a bad guy to them, but the yeah. more they know the more they realise how horrible he was, you know, to everyone else. But they yeah. sort of can't sort of give way to the fact that they did love him as a well, dad. It's like that, like that guy we talked about, I think, in Ruby's episode in Chippendale, whose name was like China or something. Yeah. That Jamie, do you remember that guy? And he was like, he was like a yeah, sweet family man. And he, then, yeah. But then he'd be like That's dragging right. people out of the pub and putting two bullets in there. Oh, That's yeah, exactly. the guy who killed the people in that club. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Go listen to that episode. It's very good. Yeah, Chinese. Chinese. Listen to all the episodes. Right. He, Keep listening to this one too. Yeah. No, don't turn it off. Uh, so, <laughs> Please. So, um, this guy, yeah, he the same relationship. So, so Alan Saffron is his son and Alan Saffron wrote a book about him. The book was called Gentle Satan. <laughs> <laughs> like, fuck oh, me. Wow. Uh, and uh, so basically the, the, <laughs> another quote about Saffron about Abe was that if the confidential police records on Saffron were ever released there'd be another three royal commissions wow. this guy was the most just so basically he was the most corrupt and the most influential criminal uh, uh, absolutely in Sydney and probably when you consider the scale of Sydney, Australia wide, right? Uh, he yeah. also had fingers in every pie across the, across the whole country, but he's mainly based in Sydney. But the thing is, he really, like, all of his magic was sort of behind the scenes. So basically, the history of this guy, um, he, uh, when he was 25 years old, um, so this is like in the, in the, uh, in the 50s, mm. He bought and owned uh, the Roosevelt Hotel. He somehow figured he got his dad to borrow him money. He'd sort of just been a no, sort of no, normal guy. Grew up in the inner west, and um, the Roosevelt Hotel at the time there was yeah strict um, drinking laws and stuff like that around like the pubs had to be shut at midnight and stuff like that. And he just went fuck it, and he just kept the pub. He just kept his thing open till four. That's and there's, it. And then just brought lockdown protest the baby. Keep Sydney <laughs> open. That's this guy's <laughs> yeah, whole life. So he uh, he basically was like, I'll just do this. And then the cops that come around to like check, I'd just be like, no, from 12 to 4, I'm not serving alcohol. I'm just serving like, you know, uh, post, uh, you know, after dinner mints, you know, whatever. And uh, I'll Classic. just fucking uh, bribe these cops. And the cops are like, yeah, for fucking A. So he did that. And not only do he do that, he was like, well, I'm not fucking putting any of this money on the books. I'm not paying tax on any of this shit either, you know. So he started doing that. He's 25. And he's and the Roosevelt Hotel became the biggest club in Sydney. It was like the rich of the richest, the the fucking everyone that that uh, wanted a good time. It was the last call, you know. And he, and he was up in Kings Cross. Uh, the Roosevelt Hotel was like Darlinghurst or something. It was just so yeah, it's in the area. In the area that, but it was it was that sort of um, that the the entertainment sort of square. I don't know if it was technically there, but Surrey Hills maybe uh, at the worst at the sort of. Uh, I think it still exists. I, I, I was think it's, say, co- it's come back it. as a uh, uh, what do you call like an homage place, but it isn't the exact same place. Uh, right. I think it's it was slightly different. Um, but then he what he did was he started visiting the USA because he was a bit of a gangster sort of wannabe. I think he loved like the power. He was, the, his son and said the only thing he cared about was sex and power. Like he's just one of those guys. Like he cared about money, but he only wanted money for power. Like he he was just all about having the power. So he started going to the USA and he was making connections there. He, he started bringing huge names to Sydney to perform at his clubs. Um, Frank Sinatra. These are people who've never been to Australia wow. before. Frank Sinatra, Nat King Cole, Louis Armstrong, Chubby Checker, Sammy Davis Jr. He's bringing them all to Sydney. Man, to tour this is around. like it's like when you get a comedy producer here who'll fly someone out 
but you, they don't quite know what gigs they sort of get themselves in. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I wonder if Sinatra rocked up to the gig. Like, what the fuck is I this? I saw a photo of yeah. Sinatra when Sinatra he d- just like having a cigarette outside with someone. They're be like, "I'm playing the Roosevelt later," and yeah. someone's just like, "Oh boy!" Yeah, I'm doing two 20 minute sets. I got a drink voucher. Uh, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, so he was uh, he was doing that, and, he, and then while he was over there, he was dealing with these guys' management in Vegas and in uh, LA, and especially in Vegas, their management is very uh, mafioso, if you know what I mean. At least has yeah. connections yeah. within L- those. Loud rooms. and clear, because you just said it. Wink, <laughs> uh, wink. If you know what I mean. They are career criminals, <laughs> if you will. Uh, They're so, fans of the Gabagool, if you know what I mean. So uh, they, uh, he starts seeing them, and then they're like, no, 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 this is how you run clubs. Like, this is... And so he oh, hell yeah. effectively comes back uh, to Australia with all these uh, little things under his hat about that this is like mafia, mm. this is organized took, crime. It, it's like he took an MBA in being yeah, a fucking cr- exactly criminal. what he did, and he, you know, uh, he saw what was happening over there. He saw, and Australia was so naive at the time to, I mean, they they just it was like no no one like bribing cops was like small fry stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was yeah. like how to get out of small stuff. It wasn't like this sort of institutionalized corruption that that they had over there. So um. He, uh, he also helped open the first, well, he funded the opening of the first strip club in Australia, which is in the cross, or was oh, in the yeah. cross, um, Stracato um, <laughs> Club. Stracato. Uh, I think it's. Man, uh, workshop that name a bit more. Yeah, I know. Nah, he's just going with the Italian they couldn't, thing. They couldn't get the right domain, I think, so they uh, had to chop around. <laughs> yeah, but then, this uh, is uh, just like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put, <laughs> this in that, you put this like in modern times, and it's just like a fucking guy with a Scarface poster being like. I'm going to ha- be the biggest criminal of all time. Yeah. Dude, you say so, that. Th- th- I, I can't find the quote, but someone was like, in his house, he just had mafia posters on his of walls. Course. <laughs> like, he absolutely did. Like, from the Godfather. Like, he would, that was the only thing he liked. That um, fucking rules so uh, hard. That's I know. hilarious. To have, like, the biggest crime boss also be, like, a huge and, nerd. Yeah. Just a dork. Just an absolute uh, fucking loser. But it's like he, imagine like a, a guy like about to like slice your throat for snitching, and you're like, man, I've got the criterion of the Godfather trilogy, and he's like, me and you, kid, we're gonna go far. <laughs> <laughs> so he, um, and then what happened was, as he's starting that, he started start um, opening up clubs, and as he's sort of getting into his stride, Vietnam's going on, and Vietnam has a lot of American, a lot of Australian soldiers, and a lot of them. They do an R and R, so they're coming off tour and they're going to Australia to Sydney to have a couple of weeks of respite before they go back. And um, so they're American, they're fucking young, they're whatever, they've got money, and they basically that sort of is like the big spark for King's Cross is all these American and Australian and other you know um, soldiers coming into town with money, single, and just going around. And we had strip clubs, and he was like, "Fuck, this is a, this mm. is the fucking money here." So. It's like a reverse t- barley. Yeah. Like everyone from there, everyone from Southeast Asia coming over here, here and exactly. just running Been amok, but they're all American soldiers. Foster's singlets and stuff, you know. <laughs> and then, uh, so he had, um, at his height, he had 100 brothels and 50 nightclubs in Holy Australia. Shit. He, um, he had th- some of these famous ones, like the infamous ones in Sydney were Venus Room, Pink Panther Club, Pink Pussycat Club. Carousel Club, Roosevelt and Stracato. They were the, his big sort of, uh, uh, his headline, uh, blue chip clubs. Um, he, he wasn't, the other thing, like he'd been a couple of uh, trouble a couple of times, but not for no, nothing really. When he was like 15, he got caught like um, uh, doing illegal betting or something. And then, and, he, and then in the 60s, he got caught and charged. He was participating in an orgy, and Fuck which was yeah, scandalous dude. conduct. And he basically... Um, it was like this hardcore orgy and they don't even really say what was happening, but it sort of alludes to like, he was like, it, it's like they sort of hardcore porn now was back then, like the most extreme thing you'd ever fucking imagine. So he was into some crazy shit. So Jeez. they don't actually say what it was, but they sort of wink, wink at it. it was some, uh, he was doing some pretty like, like, you know, tied up in leather and shit like yeah. that. He and was doing the devil's missionary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Doggy style, yeah. That, that's <laughs> he was a, the whole big, that was one of his royal commissions. Was uh, Hold on, was the woman on top? Because we got to... Uh, <laughs> no, we can't be having that. We can't that. be having that. So anyway, so that, he, but, it, but he really is staying out of um, 
most of the uh, most of the fucking uh, uh, drama and the, the cops and everything like that. But he he starts to implement all these um, uh, USA mafia style things. He starts getting a million companies, so he's got like a hundred different companies on his books. Um, he's actually implementing a criminal enterprise. He's like moving people around. You're the owner of this. You're the owner of that. Um, and he's paying pay, paying off cops. Um, he's he, he's got all these cops on his books. But the mafia teach him this little trick which he's the first one to implement, which was he starts, he has a hotel, like an actual like uh, stay in a hotel, and he's got all these buddies, like mates, like he's, you know, paying cops off and he's paying off all these people. And he's like, hey, do you like girls? And like, yeah, he's like, come here and, and you can fuck this girl and go and tow to my hotel. And he's putting them in rooms while they're having sex and he's filming it secretly. Uh, and so he's oh, then- This is the fucking the Epstein play. Yeah, so then he's, uh, well, I don't know what <laughs> not, website not exactly you've been on. That's what he was doing. He, had the whole pl- he had his whole mansion was like rigged up with cameras and shit. I what, for his own enjoyment or yeah. I didn't know? No, I think to hold yeah, shit over black people. Player. So that's what I thought that- Drew was about to go to bat for Epstein. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's like what they did to poor Jeffrey. I'm, sa- I'm saving that for our little St. James episode. <laughs> <laughs> See if we can find anyone who was born. Went to school, little St. James. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what, he, uh, any bars there, Lil' St. James? <laughs> I got a great, ba- pretty bad review here. Uh, one star. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what's the general vibe of Lil' St. Uh, James? <laughs> um, <laughs> so then, uh, yeah, so he's doing that and he, he's then got all these people in his pocket and no one suspects this. This is like, you, no one was, it was like, oh, fuck this girl, whatever. So he's got just absolute catalogs of all these prominent people in New South Wales and that what everyone thinks is like when they said if that ever got released all of that stuff is is in there right so then he starts blackmailing people um he's uh he's basically uh this is like robert askin was a premier in new south wales like the gladys right yeah mm. of, and, and it, adamant he was in his book like adamant that he was uh, caught up in it um and and like uh, the, the high court justice, so a guy on like the high court of New South Wales, all the police force, the entire, all the way to the top, they were all basically wrapped up. Um, the When he died, there's a dossier that his son received in his estate that the son's like, I I gave to the cops, they've got it, but there's some pretty fucked up shit in that. Oh, it's and, fucking in the bottom of the harbour now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that fucking burn of that. Hey, put that shit bit, on eBay. The old Tilly, Tilly Divine tip bit of petrol <laughs> on it. Yeah. So, that, that, like, for example, he had his standover man, um, uh, Jimmy Anderson was his, like, right-hand man, one of his muscle. And mm. Donnie the Glove, another standover man from a different gang, walked into a full bar and, like... Um, come up to him to like to assault Jimmy Anderson. Jimmy Anderson pulled out a gun, shoots him once. And then as he's turned around, John, um, Jimmy Anderson shoots him three times in the back. Um, he pled self-defense. Not only did he get off on that, they didn't even, didn't even go to court. So they arrested <laughs> him. Jesus. They arrested yes. him. And then it went to like, uh, the detectives looked at it and it got no build, which is like, they didn't even try to charge him. They just said, we can't do anything. It's like it's less like, than a slap on the wrist. Yeah, <laughs> it's le- not even an acquittal or even like, it, 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 it not even got away with it. They were like, it was a full bar of people who all said it was him. Like what? No yeah, one deba- yeah. de- de- debated what. So that was like, they were like, okay, there's some fucking shit going on there. Um, and But eventually Jimmy Anderson, so he just had this whole enterprise. He's pulling all these strings. And then I think Jay, I think this is probably the um, the Juanita section, which is I didn't really dive into this because Jamie had some info on it. But the the background I believe is like he he was also someone who could get shit sorted for people. So he yeah. he had so much power, and he wasn't really at the coal face of it all. He would lend money to people to open a bar, and then you know mafia style, and then he would protect them. And, yeah, and so yeah. he was never he was always one step away from the action. And the, the Juanita thing was 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 uh, interesting, James. You, have you got? Yeah, it sounds like uh, the the fact that the mafia taught him to have all uh, his hands in these companies was probably Juanita Nielsen's undoing. Because Juanita Nielsen was a she was an heiress to a, a hotel fortune from Mark Foy, and basically 
she lived like the dream heiress life. Like she moved to like an artsy bohemian community and used her heiress money to start an independent paper. It's like when really rich people start getting into stand up. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Know? Or like making a zine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or someone who's just like, Yeah, I did all of the U C B classes and you're like, How'd you afford that? And they're like, Oh daddy. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's but like, so basically like this uh, She was Mark Mark Mark, Mark Foy's, right? It was Mark Foy's. Yeah, yeah, Mark Foy's. And she uh, set up Which is like, ironically, where the fucking courthouse is now. Yeah. In that building. So she used her financial connections to establish this uh, local newspaper called Now, which uh, they ran out of her heritage-listed house. And, like, at first it was just used to cover the lifestyle of the cross and kind of shed light on local businesses. So it would have, like, fashion coverage, a lot of it with Juanita, like, modeling the fashions to promote local businesses and promoting local restaurants and whatnot. But uh, the paper gains popularity, and also Juanita becomes kind of more involved in local issues. And so the big one kind of at the time was that there are a lot of developers in King's Cross seeing what a potential cash cow it was and just fucking bulldozing the working class tenants to put up big apartment blocks when sydney council's doing all this they're not consulting the locals they've just been like all right here's the money out you go pause Mm. and so eventually the council comes for victoria street which is where juanita nielsen and her father live and so she gets involved and she's trying to involve uh like implement green bands and in um, cutting off water and sewage at these sites where people are trying to build and she's also mobilizing tenants and shareholders to kind of hold up the process which in turn like led to developers grinding to a halt and pissing all their money away while they're trying to deal with stuff like getting the sewage turned on so not a popular figure because she's just causing these people to bleed thousands of dollars Mm. and uh so police kind of start enforcing the developer evictions and i'm sure they were probably backed by the very deep pockets and hot women from abe saffron Mm. and so at this point like residents get kidnapped and physically threatened like people people kill people basically being like get the fuck out of here or we'll kill you and they do it like either directly or inadvertently and so Juanita gets disgusted by this she's pissed off and she starts going for it uses a newspaper to be like these people are piece of shit this is what they're doing and at this point she kind of starts fearing for her life because um you know yeah, people because these people are killing people to get <laughs> yeah, their way because, and I'm yeah, because other world. people are dying and she's yeah. the only person loudly speaking up about oh. it and she's also reckons that people have like started following her and uh like on knocking facebook. on her door and so yeah yeah it's all on facebook <laughs> but basically she was summoned to a meeting at um the carousel which is an abe saffron owned club to essentially discuss like advertising i think it was or to progress this meeting <laughs> to, and to, win, to, to win a free boat that she yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. exactly she's invited to one of abe's establishments which was a giant cardboard box with a stick propped up and a large <laughs> rope coming off it yeah and so she goes in never seen again Ooh. body has still not been found fuck it is still as of 2021, 25th of August, an unsolved case. Uh, but within 24 hours of Juanita's disappearance, like her home and her office are ransacked. Like all the research papers about this development stuff are gone. And the um, the latest copy of her newspaper now, which was going to feature a huge expose on all these events and name names, including like developers, police, Abe Saffron and stuff, that's gone. And that Shit. just gets lost to time. It's a fucking noir story. And yeah. That's that's the thing is it's like there's no physical or it's not one of those things where it's like, you know, they found Abe's bloody glove next to her board. Like it's just yeah. th- there's no evidence pointing to him directly, but every single piece of circumstantial evidence yes. is. So, yeah. so it's like you can understand why it's not solved, but it's also like there's no question what the fuck happened. Yeah. It also seems like everyone just knows it's him. Yeah, yeah of course, of yeah. course. And... uh 
and so like like I said, like when I was talking about his son, his son wrote this book, and in the book, his son said, "Look, I know he's a bad guy, but I never, I do not know of any time he he, he said the whole books was gentle Satan." So he's like, "My dad was a guy who he condoned violence, and he would hint at violence, and he would u- tell people in a way to use violence to solve problems. We would never sort of legitimize it, or he'd never actually commit violence himself, or say kill this person. He would just say, "Well, you need to sort it out," sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And then when the book came out, this guy Alan Saffron said he got contacted by a bunch of people. He's like, "No, he told people to kill. I know five <laughs> people he killed." And, uh, <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, okay. Well, I was wrong about that." Yeah, so not, um, not so gentle, Satan. Yeah, yeah, not so gentle, Satan. Uh, so he, um, so that was the whole thing with with Abe was like he generally was. Um, in the end, he uh, he didn't get done for anything. He did, though, speaking of um, uh, Al Capone, he got done for tax evasion. That's all he ever got done for. This is how uh, they all get done. Yeah, and it was the same thing I said about the, 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 the... It was the old keeping the money off the books because you have the... At 12, you stop serving alcohol, but you're actually really selling mm. it. And so he had white books. And the guy... Who um, turned on him was the, was Jimmy Anderson, the guy who got off on that murder charge. He eventually was like, um, uh, he he turned on him. Eventually, just said, "Yep, I fell out with him." Turned on him, and uh, they finally did him, and he served 17 months in jail um, in the 80s when he was in his sort of 70s. So he was yep. sort of a spent force in terms of influence by then. And then I think they said when he went to jail, the allure of him was away because he was sort of this untouchable guy. And it was then it was like this seven-year-old guy getting dragged to jail. And it was a bit sort of like when OJ went to jail, you know, yeah. it was like, oh, okay, you know, it's just this old man going to jail now. It's yeah, not sort yeah. of... a bit like when OJ went to jail. It was unfair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, the second time was arguably unfair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it certainly should have gone the first time. Um, but uh, but the, the sort of... Uh, the, just to, to wrap it up there, there's all this other stuff about his actions because there's sort of murders that happened at the time, but a lot of interest about Abe has, has sparked recently because of the whole ghost train ride at Luna Park. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. So what happened with that was in the 1979, a fire breaks out of the ghost train and seven people are killed and it's ruled as an accident. Luna Park shut down for 15 years and the owners sort of go past and then the new owners take it over. And I don't know if there was sort of like murmurs at the time, but that's sort of how it sits for a while. Um, but, uh, you know, only recently did, did, did people start to look into the fact that all the way before 1979, up until the fire, Abe is like jostling hardcore to take over the park. Um, he wants to take it over. He wants to fucking do stuff with it, turn into a nightclub, that sort of thing. He's really pushing hard for it. Um, he doesn't get his way. And then the fire happens. And then this new company takes it over and they find out in the 2000s that he owned that company. He had a part ownership in that company that took it over. So he had his fucking thing. So it was sort of like this whole thing where he's like, oh, nothing to do with that. And they find out in the 2000s. And then 2006, um, he died. Um, But in an interview uh, for the the Herald, his niece, Anne Buckingham, when she when asked about the 1979 Luna Park fire that killed seven people, she laughs nervously and then says, "Very strange that fire. Uh, I don't think people were meant to be killed." And um, <laughs> so hell. that so that comes out, and then basically she because he just died, and that was like, and by the way, busted open by Kate McClymon, who in the last episode. Um, I mentioned she was the reporter who was yeah. spent her King's Cross telling people abuse on the streets. So she busted this open. But then th- this Mrs. Buckingham called the Herald the next day and demanded not to publish a story because she was contesting Saffron's will and it would not advance her cause. <laughs> and um, <laughs> she then yeah. sent I want le- some of that blood money. Yeah, she then sent a letter denying she'd ever uttered the words tribute to her. Um, uh, but the Herald said they were recorded in a face-to-face taped interview. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that happens yeah. and everyone's like, fuck me, you know. <laughs> and then so the theory that – and I haven't looked, um, but I think they did a doco on it and a podcast on it but recently to get more info on it. They're going to do a podcast on it when we cover Luna Park. When we do Luna Park. <laughs> when we're um, truly out of ideas. And we just listen to another podcast and go, apparently yeah. this uh, happened. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait, so listen to this part. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then so uh, 
it comes out that you know uh, he pretend, like the theory is he paid bikies to do it and they didn't mean to kill anyone they just meant to set fire to it and burn it down whatever uh, who cares no but that the, the, the real interesting thing is that over following two years another six of his premises saffron's actual premises all of them well insured were destroyed by fire right oh, wow so this guy and here's two more right so these two have not no one's accusing him of of this except for me right but, but <laughs> is this an exclusive community notice board scoop yes and i'm gonna do no more investigation but people sort of <laughs> hint at it but the savoy uh so the um the savoy hotel it's next door to the pink panther pink panther club at the time right this is in the uh, 79 now to put it in place it's where the mcdonald's is now in king's cross at pots point oh right? i've been there brother mm-hmm. yeah. oh yeah we've all been there <laughs> um so so it's the mcdonald's and then the, the Pink Panther, so the Savoy Hotel, and then next door to that is the Pink Panther and Showgirls, and then uh, is Showgirls now. The next door is the Potts Point Hotel. The Savoy Hotel burns to the ground. 15 people die. They arrest this guy. He's a petty criminal. He's a complete nutcase. But Abe Saffron owns it and claims all the insurance, right? And this guy is a mental case. Like, he's a complete nutcase. But they arrest him as a firebug or whatever. Mm. And then six years later, the Down Under Hostel burns to the ground. Six people die. Guess where it's located? The pink. It's at the Pink Panther. It's next door. So both uh, of these places are owned by Abe Saffron, next door to each other. They both burn down. They arrest the guy, Gregory Allen Brown, petty criminal, complete nutcase. They both fucking burn to the ground, and they're both owned by him. And he's both has all this insurance money from it. And they both rel- they both arrest a complete crazy guy to, for the crime. Uh, and then so those two, everyone keeps hinting it. They keep going. Abe Saffron owned it. Mm, isn't that interesting? Here's my one. This is my... No one's ever hinting at this but me. The, Rem, <laughs> the Rembrandt Hotel, 1981. I don't know if Abe owned it, and this is more of a general thing, which I think is very interesting. Rembrandt Hotel, 1981. Um, fire broke out, 2 a.m. Local residents reported an explosion in the four-story, 71 room Rembrandt Hotel, the city of the, in the center of King's Cross. Firefighters found two small gasoline cans in front of the hotel, but police inspector said there was no strong evidence of arson. <laughs> ah, police room was probably taken. Nineteen people. Nineteen people are dead. The whole thing burns to the ground. A few years later, the site is auctioned off and becomes Hugo's. Oh, oh shit! Across I've the road from Hugo's. World, yeah, which is like, uh, uh, what did it become now? But it's like one of the biggest nightclubs in the fucking city, and it well, was it a was hotel huge when it was Hugo's. Now yeah. I think it's kind of dead, right? Yeah, yeah. But in the so it was this 1981 it was a shitty old hotel. It burns to the ground. Twenty people die. There's petrol cans everywhere, and yeah. then it, and then it's sold off. And no no a sign of arson. No <laughs> sign of arson. And uh, they've heard an explosion, and it's like holy fuck. Is this? Jeez. Are we officially moving forward? Community notice board reckons that the fire that led to Hugo's being established was arson for Abe Saffron. I don't know if it was Abe Saffron, but whoever owned that hotel, fucking, I guarantee caused it. And I wouldn't be surprised if he had his finger in it. Fucking, like that's Absolutely. crazy. Fuck. And Let's it was just like, send this podcast to a bunch of journalists being like interested. And they're like, what's all the <laughs> stories about apostrophes? <laughs> what do you mean journalistic integrity what does that mean yeah. um and just to finally on a <laughs> i don't want to do that because some fucking criminal woman's gonna dive out of the light rail and slash me up so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gonna work. so lastly just on abe so he was his whole career he got away with everything except for that 18 months in jail they called him mr sin like his whole career Fuck, right that's a mr. Cool nickname. Sin. not a trigonometry thing which would be pretty cool you know <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm mr cos i'm mr cos <laughs> he's mr tan um, yeah they call me pythagoras <laughs> <laughs> so mr sin and uh anyway he when he gets out of jail he gets real sensitive about it and he hates it and uh he hates being called mr sin yeah he he, he doesn't like because he's like i'm not i'm not a bad guy I did nothing wrong his whole i never did anything wrong everyone calls me mr sin in two everyone calls me mr sin come into my lounge room surrounded by mafia pictures <laughs> yeah. yeah and uh, you call me gentle satan for some reason yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in 2004 he's two years before he dies he successfully sued a Gold Coast newspaper for defamation because his name was the answer of a crossword clue. Fuck <laughs> yeah. Six down, Sydney underworld figure nicknamed Mr. Sin, 3-7. 
that wow. he sued them and won. And won. That's crazy. I don't know how much he got, but he fucking won. He, he sued the Gold Coast because they called him because he his name was Abe Saffron, Mister Sin. So there you go. After all that, he was still uh. fucking punching, and he was like, "Dude, you got away with it. You spent your whole year life apart from eighteen months." clean sailing and he's like how dare you besmirch my name Come yeah on. i mean at 80 like i mean honestly i think if that was me if i'm 85 you know at that point a i'm doing every drug known to man just being like something's gonna take me out and mm. b like it'd just be like yeah of course i did it dude like i rock I'd, fucking, I'd get mr yeah. sin on the back of a jersey man. <laughs> I'd get I'd mr. Like, mr sin on my year 12 jersey yeah 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 <laughs> I'd get it on my fuck it. I'd be like Mr. Cool Ice, you know that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, be like Mr. I'd Mr. license Sin it tattoos. out to those yeah. those little the Mr. Books, you know? They've got yeah, Mr. Yeah, Sin, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Fat, Mr. Yeah, Long. Fuck franchise the whole thing, man. Mr. Sin Steakhouse, I'd be going crazy. It's a sick <laughs> nickname, man. It doesn't even... Um, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, so that's a, a. B. Boy Saffron. Um, and he kind of... There's so many parallels with, with his, I guess, successor. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab a beer before we... Finish the Ibrahim. Go cool. for it. All right. Well, um, yeah, like I say, there's, it, it's a weird how much parallel there is with this dude because arguably the next, um, you know, sort of the heir to the throne of, of King's Cross is Big Johnny Ibrahim. Mm-hmm. Little Teflon, Johnny Ibrahim. T- Teflon John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a, he's a small dude. Yeah. You'll get sued for um, defamation. They call him... So he's Teflon John. He's the last king of King's Cross. He's... Uh, According to his girlfriend, he likes to be called Sexy John. So. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't? But, yeah. Yeah. I, ask I like to, to be called Sexy John. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I ask Amy to call me Sexy John all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, and he has a similar thing. Like he, he basically arrives to the cross in the late 80s as a, a, a 16 or a 17 year old. Um, and he's kind of like, I think one of the teachers at his school said something like, John, you know, you're either going to end up dead or very rich. Mm. He, so he just kind of had that attitude of, of same with Abe. Like he, this is a guy who would have been fucking good fellas posters on the wall, Scarface, okay. but he's also, he, you know, he's also a, like his family's Muslim and he still is like, I don't touch drugs. I don't touch alcohol. Um, his siblings you can't say as much for like his brother sam definitely is like i think in jail right now for drug importation and then there's like Fadi, who had been sh- who's been shot uh i think possibly got charged for something recently as well but, but like a lot of like drug importation was there like that. was there dad and shit into that or was it literally all the brothers got involved sort of like themselves no, I, I think it was just the brothers. It started with um, his older brother, Sam, right. who I think was the first Lebanese I- I- member, either either member or like certainly like high level member of an Australian bikey gang. Right. It was the first time they let like a Lebanese guy get to that sort of ranking. Oh, wow. Um, and he, yeah, he rocks up to the cross and it, within like his first year there i think when he was 18 or even 17 he got into like this big brawl and he still has this like crazy scar across his stomach from where he was stabbed in this thing but he basically in his own words he he you know all he wanted to do is manage bars and restaurants he in his in his sort of like the way he tells his own life story it's like all about the hot he's just a hospo guy (laughs) 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 yeah Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. loves nothing more than a towel over the shoulder yeah exactly um, but he starts managing the uh, tunnel nightclub quite young. Like, I think 18 years old or something like that. He's managing um, tunnel, which I don't... Do you guys... Do you have any experience of ever going there? I'm not sure no. when it's shot. I think the only club I went to in the cross was probably World Bar. Mm. Like before... It's really close to World Bar. Before... Um, where, oh, where it was. I, I think I've been in- to Candy's apartment once during a blackout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what the electricity went down or something? <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I couldn't see Jamie to stop him coming in. So I like, oh, no, sorry, I I blacked out and went to an apartment with Candy. Kill him, Candy Divine. Uh, um, so he was eighteen and he's well. Yeah, how do you get cr- that job? Five it foot was- five and he's like telling. 30 year old roided guys mate <laughs> yeah. you've had to but you can't come well, in like everyone says about him is he's um he's just charming you know he's got there's something about him he's got one of those personalities he can 
he can talk anyone into doing anything. Everybody wants to be his friend. He makes you feel like the coolest guy in the world when he talks to you. So he's obviously got that sort of magnetic personality. And Drew that Bensley <laughs> <laughs> I like to see me fumbling trying to manage a nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, shit. Uh, you got to sign in, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to if you Make sure work. you scan your QR code. Yeah, if you don't believe in it, you know, I'm not going to make it. Uh, <laughs> can you be my friend? Uh, um, I like you. But he kind of like that's with, with, the, with, with the older stories. <laughs> I oh, put man. a sticker on your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I would actually shine. <laughs> getting stickers in the hands. Everyone's getting a stamp to get in the nightclub. It's just our fucking podcast. It's <laughs> <Yeah. like, laughs> like the Goodfellas narration of you putting stickers up everywhere. Be like, we thought these days would never end. Drew <laughs> <laughs> was in pub toilets all around Sydney putting up stickers for the podcast. Man, that boy could put up a sticker. Let me tell you. <laughs> Um, mm. and I guess cause his story is really still going. There's not like with these guys in the past, they started to get to a certain age and shit starts to come out. Mm. But this dude, he's, you know, he's in his fifties now. He's sort of, he's just about to have a kid with, uh, his girlfriend who, nice. if you, if you read the articles, he has got all set up on some gun charges like do you guys remember that story um his partner someone budge i think her last name is i can't remember her first name sarah budge maybe mm. um but basically like the cops just found a gun in her cupboard oh, nice. like in, in a raid and she's like i've never seen this gun before they're like you know given her i i guess I believe that she had never seen it before. Like, it was just in her closet, like, next to her fucking shoes. Like, it had been hastily thrown in there. Mm. She's like, I've never seen it before. The cops were like, you know, she didn't know how it worked or anything, which, like, if you had seen it, you're not going to fucking pull it out, start spinning around the finger and just firing shots off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Shooting That's an apple off someone's head. Rubbish excuse. Just, yeah, uh, I have no is. idea how. But to... there was, like, her prints <laughs> yeah. weren't on it. It's her also prints very, weren't it's on a, it. It's also very easy to fake. It's just to, like, grab the nozzle and, like, do you do this? Do you <laughs> hit people on the head? Is that, what is this just thing? Just sticking it in her mouth being like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, sure, she doesn't sound like sort of person. There's no just prints like, on it. Uh, his DNA's on it. You know what I mean? Like, it's uh, it's some dodgy sort of gun. So it's she the, eventually so it's the King's Cross version of taking a speeding ticket for your partner. Like, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 She yeah. took the points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she got off recently, I think, but yeah, they're about to have a kid together. And so it's a lot of, it's this whole thing and, you know, his whole reputation as Teflon, uh, John is because literally, you know, he, both his brothers, uh, I think in jail right now, maybe Fadi isn't, but the, every single person around him is like involved in something and nothing will ever get to him. Like he's mm, got this, mm, like that weird yeah, bubble. Right around him where he just cannot fucking catch a charge sure. and, he, and when you're talking about like abe with the cameras in the house like yeah. that's what i was th when i was reading up on him i was like he must have a fucking cache of of like dirt oh, wow. on the biggest cops in in the city like he has to have something or yeah. otherwise there's no way um and he was like so he was, was he doing the same thing where he was sort of taking a step back or was he like, man, man, like, date? Because you said he started uh, running it. Like, if you're running, yeah. you, you're at you Always. Can't. He, he always was like, I've, I'm legit. I run this establishment. But everyone's like, you know, you, you're a fucking drug dealer. You, right. uh, you control drugs on the strip. And he's just like, that yeah, seems like it, but what, what do you know? <laughs> Not me. Yeah. Like he said that that was a cop thing. Um, I, I think it was during the there was a royal commission, um, and it was essentially it was like the Fitzgerald Commission in Queensland that we talked about in Grace's episode, mm -hmm. but it was for um, the New South Wales Police, mm -hmm. and so they did this um, complete, you know, this full commission, this inquiry into corruption in especially the King's Cross um, Police Force, and it, it netted a shitload of people, like people going to jail, losing their jobs because they uncovered like just endemic corruption and he was like a big figure he had he got called before the commission a few times and there was some quote i don't have it directly in front of me but it's something to the effect of like you know the guy running it is like it would seem that you're the you're the biggest drug runner on king's cross and he was like yeah it would seem that way but not me yeah <laughs> like he's just he's that brave well, that, that's that. what they suggested about abe was like they were like if you want drugs you go to his clubs and it's there and there's no way he doesn't know about it. And what they suspected was instead of him running drugs, he would charge drug dealers 
fee to right. deal in his clubs. Yeah. So he had no he had no direct connection to the drug dealers, and so he. Would, but if you were dre- dealing drugs in his clubs and you didn't pay him, he would fucking kill you or bash you or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So he I had mean, one step behind it, and it's like, well, you effectively it's a good just, business model. Yeah, yeah, and it, I wouldn't be surprised if he just did the same thing, and then they were like, well, we've arrested this guy for dealing drugs, but he's got no day to day contact with. John, yeah, like yeah. it's not like he's re-upping with John. He's just yeah. paid him once fifty grand in cash and, and an alley, and that's yeah. it. That's the whole, you know. Yeah. And he's whole like it's crazy that he's managed to get the, like by this long. It, it, what is it? So he's in his fifties. You know, this is mm. over third, you know, three decades of of being involved in this world and not getting. Like he's he's had his house raided a couple of times, but there's no like real substantive charges against him. Mm, mm. Um, some funny stuff is like he's he released his he's released a book which is apparently like it won like crime book awards in australia like i think it's called the um dangar prize after i think dangar crescent which is where that la frankie was killed you just watched blue uh, murder yeah, right yeah, here yeah, yeah. he um you know and he tried like he's visited roger the dodger in prison because he tried he tried to get the rights to that sequel that they made to blue murder oh and, like, yeah he, want, he wanted to produce it yeah um and oh, kill a cop! I think he his ABC Media Watch is like obsessed with his relationship with the media because he has this whole thing where it's like he's like, eh, you know, leave me alone, guys. But he's feeding them the scoops and, mm. and wanting to to have this image, you know. And he's palling around with like fucking douchebags like Kyle Sandilands and like Ben Fordham is like Ben Fordham is the just this little fucking the dweebiest cunt. I know. Who, yeah, yeah. Who, come on, who, man. We could get him on the pod. Well, he, uh, yeah. he um, uh, he'd have to pay us to get on the pod. <laughs> you reckon? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he would. There's no way. <laughs> I reckon he'd pay oh. up some cash. <laughs> I don't think so. He's fucking, yeah. He's, Wait, he's, after, after this tape leaks, this is what we hold over him. Me calling him a dweeb. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got the goods on you for them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but he he tried to interview him once and he like got rejected or something and then he like sucked up to him until he like let him interview him and now he like pretends they're best friends oh, um nice. but but uh carl sandlands is the, is the big the big one who's just like you know we're best buds we met in a pizza we fucking party together um he he's, he's so this girlfriend of his who he's put up on these gun charges uh there's all these text messages came out between them during the trial because it's part of the evidence um, tendered. Yeah. And so they were all public. And he's just like, it's just, it's pretty fucking embarrassing to read. It's like the most harrowing shit where it's like her being like, hey, babe, babe, why are you ignoring me? And then like a day later, like, hey, haven't seen you in a while. Wouldn't mind hanging out tonight. Oh. Then him responding, fuck off, I'm busy. And then her like, Okay, uh, well, you know, like it'd be nice to see you again. Haven't oh. seen you in a couple of days. Oof, we've all been there, though. If, yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as in, we've all been her sending the message <laughs> to a yeah, John Ibrahim of her own. Yeah. Just, yeah. Hey, I just found a AK-47 on the couch. Is this? <laughs> what is this uh, the cops want to know who's the mind. Or? Just got the latest Fallout Boy album, Amanda. If you want to come biggest, over and listen to it, the biggest <laughs> slap in the face is there's this exchange over a couple of days where she her mum is in hospital and so she's spending quite a bit of time there mum's quite sick johnny fucking johnny's not nowhere to be seen he's not visiting um <laughs> so she's texting her the whole time like you know can can you maybe like can i see you it seems like they don't see each other for dating. they're supposed to be dating they, they don't see oh. each other for weeks at a time and um there's one point where she's like hey mum's read mum read your book she really she liked your book no response from him oh. And then a day later, he's on the Kyle and Jackie O show talking about how he, he's how he's single. He's oh, like, oh, yeah, I'm on the market. And so oh. there's all these messages from her being like, hey, my mom really likes your book. You know, she's got cancer. She's got the big C. She's in the hospital. And then all her friends like texting her like, hey, do you happen to catch that interview? Because oh. he's there like, oh, I've never been more single, baby. Fuck and he's a, he what sucks. a fucking piece I'm of doing shit. The big He's kind of lingus. He did. Do, he did an interview as well with the Daily Telegraph, which is pretty funny. This is when his book came out, and so I can't tell who's like worse in the situation because he's just he's giving like a publicity interview 
but it the, it reads like a police interrogation if mm. you read the transcript mm. but also the the questions that the interview is asking is like like there's it's one thing to like softball a guy but this, this guy is he's playing like 20 questions with him <laughs> and it's just it ends up just reading fucking ridiculous so it's like this is it's a longer interview but this is like a, a segment like a short um excerpt that i thought was funny he's just like the interviewer goes, you say you hate the uh, nickname Teflon John. Is that because it implies what you that you got away with things you shouldn't have and uh, you shouldn't have done anything in the first place? And he goes, I hate the name because of the reasons in your question. <laughs> <laughs> and then he follows that up with, if there was one person you could kill and get away with it, who would it be? N- not a question I will answer. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so this is where he starts pleading the fifth. <gasps> Uh, if you had to invite three underworld figures to dinner, living or dead, who would they be and why? I would never go to dinner with three underworld figures, dead or alive. <laughs> uh, and then, is there anyone in particular that you're happy is in jail or dead? Oh, my God. Not a question I will answer. Oh. Uh, what will you tell your daughter about your life when she's old enough to understand? Leave my daughter out of this. Oh, <laughs> shit. This is and the greatest like, interview then, ever. Yeah, and then, like, right after that, it's like, The Last King of King's Cross, like, get it at all good bookstores, you know? Like, it's, what it's, it's what like is your favourite colour? Not the colour of blood. The opposite <laughs> of blood. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> it's like the most stupid, like... Just, as if, as if, like, he answered any of them, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, that he would ever be in trouble, like... You know, who would you want to kill, living or dead? Oh, I wouldn't mind knocking off this person. Yeah, that's never yeah, yeah. going to get him in trouble. Like, what no, a fucking loser. Not. But that's why I can't tell, because the, the journal's an idiot, but also he's just, yeah. like, t- such a self-serious fucking douche. He probably though. prepped in his room thinking he was going to get lease sales for weeks, you know, and he was going to get <laughs> yeah. these hard-hitting, like, real cross-examination questions, and then he just got, like, TV guide's secretary or something, <laughs> just being like... You know, who are you? Are you a you know Joey or yeah, Ross? Uh, you know, uh, who, should, who should Rachel have gone? With? I will not you know? answer that. I am clearly a Chandler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's our boy. So who knows where the story ends? It's got to be one of those things where if it, there's always got to be a structure in place that's holding these people where they are, and that's what happens when these when you get older and the cops that were like protecting you retire. There's all fucking every chance that this guy hits 70 and he gets taken down it's like like roger yeah. the dodger man I, roger I, the dodger's in the fucking long bay I, right if now. i was john ibrahim what i would just be doing is filling out my tax form so fucking well i would be like doing <laughs> i would be paying so yeah. i would be dotting every not even a h&r to, block job I'd no, be getting like one of the high none of that like covid work from home i'm gonna claim my electricity <laughs> bill shit i'm doing everything by the letter of the law because that's the only way they get these guns or they get him because you're Roger the Dodger and you go and kill you some shoot Asian a dog, kid. Drug dealer. Like yeah. that's the only, it's why it's like, do you, what do you do? Just don't shoot anyone, John, and pay your fucking taxes. Yeah, and I feel like taxes. you're going to get, uh, because once you've got enough money and power, you can put enough buffer be, between people where you can like, you shouldn't have to be killing anyone. Like Ro- Rogers and had, had to do that because he was out of, he was already a disgraced cop, right? So yeah, he was yeah. like, I need to either get power or, money or whatever i knew i need to get my hands dirty yeah, his, his latest fucking tour wasn't selling so well do you yeah. guys remember when he went on tour with chopper and fucking mark jackson yeah no i remember chopper i didn't know that he i didn't probably know who rogerson was when that was happening i remember chopper but, going on tour but when it ha- i remember like early 2000s my uh, one of my best mates sisters worked in, at the canberra theater and she like picked chopper and i and i think dodger up from the airport and and basically had to drive chopper around all day and she was you know we were so excited to meet chopper it was like the coolest thing but that was it was the stage show was chopper uh fucking roger the dodger and mark jacko jackson the former afl player and they would just i guess sit there for an hour and tell stories spin yarns about fucking murdering people <laughs> and australia <laughs> ate it up it sold theaters like it's oh, insane. probably would have been pretty entertaining it's like the jackass tour yeah mm. yeah exactly Oh Mark man, Jacko Jackass! Fuck, there you go. Well, that's it. another another episode covered. Yeah, if you go, if if anyone has any hot tips or stories, yeah, about I think anyone. We've, we've probably uh, we probably do a third one in a few months or something because we've got a few other things to touch on. But 
Yeah, I mean, there's a million fucking Kings Cross stories, but I think we've definitely covered the big players. But there's also there's so many other people that in like yeah. Lenny McPherson and all these other yeah, guys yeah. in amongst it all. Um, Anthony Skinner, uh, Chilsey Skinner, you know, he's uh, <laughs> he's the latest. Uh, Soros legs in town. Soros legs in town running Kings Cross. And like, uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully Kings Cross still comes back after COVID as some sort of a fucking uh, entertainment strip. But yeah, I think there's just, you could probably go for fucking. 50 episodes on on this place so oh, could, absolutely. Yeah. And baby we will, we will. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, if you like this episode yeah. please s- subscribe to us on apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review on apple Podcasts. you can also subscribe to our youtube channel which yeah. is handily at i believe youtube <laughs> dot <laughs> ah, fuck, I don't yeah, easy to remember it's uh, a youtube dot community youtube.com slash community notice board i believe and we also have no, that's not available. I just typed it in. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, I've forgotten what it Seamless, is. Seamless, baby. It must uh, be community notice pod or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. But also, you can just type this in the search bar and find us pretty uh, easily. We also have social media. Send us hot tips on there. Like all our stuff. Subscribe, follow, do all us. that. Tell your friends. Yeah, yeah. Tell your mates if you love the pod. Tell fucking one person. Tell you know one or two people, and that's gonna that's gonna spread if they tell a couple of people. Fuck yeah! yeah. And we'll be yeah. back next week, baby. It's gonna All be right. a good one. Cool. Right, see you, boys. Peace. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.